Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Bible study on the uh, book of Hebrews. It's really nice to be able to talk to you uh, today and to share some thoughts with you. So I give you a very warm welcome, whether or not you are from Charles Street Methodist Church in Newark or from the Newark and Southall Methodist Circuit or from further afield. You're all very welcome, and I hope that you enjoy this brief study. The intention is over the next uh, four Mondays to provide a short Bible study of around about half an hour and to place it on the YouTube channel for everybody uh, to use and hopefully enjoy. There's two reasons why we're doing this. First of all, those of you who attend Charles Street will remember that the leadership team agreed that we would do themed preaching on the book of Hebrews over the summer months and who knows that might yet happen. But it's also very timely in that the book of Hebrews speaks to us quite uniquely in these rather strange times in which we are living. And we'll talk about that as we go through our PowerPoint. Please do bear with if there's any uh, technical issues here and you may well have to turn up your volume uh, a little bit. So here we go, folks. Fix your thoughts on Jesus from the book of Hebrews with a strap line remaining faithful in difficult times. So what do we know and what don't we know about the book of Hebrews? Well, in terms of who wrote this letter, we don't know. Some people think that it was St. Paul and certainly for a long time, this letter was entitled St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews. But there's a bit of a problem there in that the style and the structure and the language used don't mirror the other letters in the New Testament, which we know were written by St. Paul. And if you remember in the other letters to people like the Ephesians or the Galatians, Paul is always very keen to tell people who he is and what his qualifications are. But there is none of this here in this letter. And again, it's a bit of a strange one in that it's more of a sermon than a letter. Whoever wrote it must have been quite well known and held a senior position in the early church. And the people who received the letter would certainly know who he was and there was no attempt to hide his identity. So when was it written? Well, we can say with some certainty that this was written about 30 years after the death of Christ in the AD 60s. Now it is written, we know before AD 70, in that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed at that date. And the writer in this book refers to the temple in Jerusalem on a number of occasions, but always within the present tense. Who were the recipients? Who was this letter written to? Well, the name kind of gives it away, doesn't it, in that the recipients were Jewish Christian believers. That is people who knew their Old Testament very well and saw it as being the definitive word of God. So the writer refers to the Old Testament repeatedly and uses it as evidence to support his argument about the nature of Jesus. Now, there is a bit of an intriguing suggestion right at the last shakings of Hebrews. In Hebrews 13, verse 24, it says, Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. And some people therefore say that this letter was actually written to Italian Christians, more likely than not those who were living in Rome. And if you think about it, there's a logic there in that Rome and the Roman Empire was undoubtedly the epicenter of the Western world and the Middle East, and that it would have been a very vibrant capital city. And we know it had a gathering of the early church within Rome. And if you remember, both St. Paul and St. Peter were incarcerated in Rome. So there would have been a lot going on in Rome and it stands that therefore this letter could have been written to people in Italy but of course would have been shared across the early church. So what was happening at this time? 
Well, actually quite a lot. We're going to explore that now over the next couple of slides. I'm sure that you've heard the saying Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Now, this refers to Emperor Nero, who was a very vicious and cruel and deluded emperor of the Roman Empire. And there is a certain amount of uh, historical inaccuracy here in that fiddles weren't invented by the time that Rome was ablaze in AD 64. What we do know is that at that time a great fire engulfed Rome for nearly a week, destroying 70% of the city and left about half of its population homeless. The emperor at the time, Nero, um, allegedly started the fire himself because he wanted to build a huge palace for himself in the centre of Rome and the, the only way he could clear space was by destroying the city centre. Now whether or not that is true we don't know but I just invite you to think that a great fire within the capital city of the Roman Empire would have sent reverberations really around the Middle East. Nero, in order to deflect blame from his ineffective and unpopular leadership and rumours that he had started the fire himself, decided to pick on the Christian church. And consequently, an awful lot of Christians were arrested and tortured and killed, including St. Peter and St. Paul. Nero, like a lot of despots and dictators, didn't let anything or anyone stand in his way. And we know that he arranged the murder of his own mother and stepbrother. Shortly after the fire, Nero committed suicide in AD 68, leading to instability across the Roman world. Now we know around about this period of time that Rome was being rebuilt, and the only way that that could be funded was through very heavy taxation across the Roman Empire, which led to a certain amount of local difficulty in Jerusalem. At this time in AD 66 to 73, we have what is called the first great Jewish revolt, caused in part by the taxation imposed by the Romans on the, uh, on the city and upon the Middle East, but also blasphemy is committed against Judaism. And when Nero committed suicide, there was a period of great instability across the Roman world. I think I'm right in saying that three emperors came and went almost in as many years, and the, the Jews in Jerusalem really took advantage of this uh, to uh, rebel against the Romans. As you can imagine, the, the Romans, once they got themselves organised, uh, decided to put down the rebellion in Jerusalem and in AD 73 they reduced Jerusalem to rubble, including the destruction of the temple. And as you can see from this little fresco that I've included, just about everything of value in Jerusalem, including all of the treasures from the temple, were taken and taken back to Rome. And if that wasn't uh, trouble enough, uh, a little time later, but still whilst this, uh, this book of Hebrews was current, in AD 79, the uh, volcano Vesuvius erupted, destroying the Roman city of Pompeii in Western Italy. And I'm sure that you've heard about the, uh, the eruption of Vesuvius and the destruction of Pompeii. But again, it was a cataclysmic event across the Roman Empire and across the Middle East, and estimated that 16,000 people were killed out of a population of around about 20,000. Now, I'm now going to give you a strange but true fact from the Bible. If you look at Acts 23 and 24, this is the account of Paul's trial before various people. But the bit I just want to point out to you is Acts 24, verse 24. And Paul has been summoned to appear between, uh, before the Roman governor, a chap called Felix. 
And it says in Acts 24, verse 24, several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. And from what we know, Paul spoke very eloquently. It says in verse 25, Paul talked about righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come. And the emperor or the governor, Felix, was afraid and said, that's enough for now. And in verse 27, two years had passed. Felix was succeeded by a chap whose name I can't pronounce, but it might be Porcius Festus. Um, and again, there's a, a kind of backstory there in that Felix was recalled by Rome because of his massacre of several thousand Jewish people. But the strange but true fact is that in AD 79, when Pompey was destroyed, Drusilla, the wife of Felix, and their son were both killed in Pompeii. And I'm betting that you didn't know that there was somebody named in the Bible who was killed at Pompeii. So, have you been paying attention, folks? I rather hope so, in that I hope you're not like the chap on the right hand side. But just to summarise, the letter was written in AD 60s, probably about 30 years after the death of Christ. Exactly at the same time, we had the terrible fire in AD 64 in Rome and Christians were blamed and persecuted. This stimulated the great Jewish revolt in Jerusalem, which was put down by considerable force by the Romans. AD 68, Nero dies, leading to great instability across the Roman Empire. In AD 79, we have the destruction of Pompeii. So, if you have been paying attention, uh, you can have a cigar. Uh, after saying that, we're Methodists, so you can have uh, a Ribena. But I'm just really wondering if that description of the latter half of the first century reminds you of anything. And it's true that we live in a world which is greatly challenged and conflicted at the moment. For example, we have the real issue, the real difficulty of climate emergency and what we are going to do about it. And then specifically, what are we as Christians going to do about the earth? And we remind ourselves that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Well, what about the refugee crisis? There are millions of people who are displaced and homeless and wandering and no place to go. And again, what is our responsibility both as a world and as Christian people to that emergency? Or what about homelessness in our own country? We know that the numbers of people who have nowhere to live is rising and that the numbers of people living on our streets is a national disgrace. And we could talk about other things like domestic abuse or poverty, war and famine. The world is really struggling at the moment. And of course, as I sit here this moment, we are in the teeth of the COVID-19 pandemic. At the moment, there are over 200,000 cases in the UK. There have been over 32,000 deaths. Some people are saying it's more like 45,000. There have been 4 million cases of COVID-19 across the world and 270,000 deaths. And by the time you hear this, those numbers will have risen. And we've all been in lockdown now for several weeks. And I just invite you to think about the price that we will pay in terms of unemployment, loss of livelihood, mental illness, taxation, family breakdown, and of course, a tragic continuing loss of life. So as always, we live too in interesting times. And I suggest to you that therefore the book of Hebrews is a good book to be studying at the moment in that that book mirrors some of the difficulties that we are facing as contemporary Christians. 
But let's return to the book of Hebrews because the writer must have been mindful of the context in which he was writing. He must have known about all of these things that were happening around and about and some of the real tensions and difficulties that people were facing. But he's also aware that he is hearing things about the state of the church and about individual believers which are concerning him. So beyond sort of the international picture, he is worried about people drifting away. And we too need to worry about people drifting away and that COVID-19 has caused some people to question their faith and some people to question the validity of God and all the suffering that is going on in the world. We also hear, of course, that uh, more people are interested in, in church and in spirituality than ever before. And certainly far more people are tuning in uh, to virtual services and Bible studies and meetings than ever meet together physically. But the writer's also worried about the lack of maturity that he's hearing about in the early church. And again, as Christians, we need to strive for a mature understanding of our faith, to test our faith and to try and understand it more deeply, which is one of the reasons why we are providing these Bible studies. And throughout the clarion call in Hebrews is to hold firm to the faith. Hebrews 10 verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And isn't that a great verse to hold on to in difficult times? You need to persevere, you need to work at your faith. You need to struggle with those issues that come your way, but hold fast. Let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. And I'm sure you know the illusion there about the person running in the Olympics, which again would have been a, uh, a very kind of current event and something that people would know about, but fixing our eyes solely on Jesus and running the race of faith. Don't be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. And again, we know that there are all manner of strange teachings around and about at the moment. And that the Christian faith is challenged by a number of things. And we have conspiracy theorists about COVID and, and all the rest of it. And again, we need to hold firm to that, what we have been taught. So let's just end our initial Bible study by thinking about, well, what's all this about then? I'm going to suggest to you that this letter has two purposes. Uh, first of all, as we've already read about uh, holding firm, sticking fast, be faithful, be steadfast, be true to your faith. Don't be discouraged or deflected by the times in which you live, by what is happening in the world around about you, however grim and however challenging and however impossible. Because as Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. But this letter has got another purpose, and that's what we will be turning our attention to over the next few weeks. The purpose is to argue that Jesus is superior to any religious teaching or revelation that has occurred in the past. And in chapters one to two, the writer talks about how Jesus is superior to angels, and we'll look at that next week. In chapters three to four, he then brings in the Old Testament prophet Moses, the greatest of Jewish leaders, uh, arguably with uh, other folks like Abraham, of course. Then he talks about the priests and the priesthood of Melchizedek in chapters five to seven. And then finally, the system of sacrifice in chapters eight to ten. How far we'll get, folks, I don't know, but we'll give it, uh, we'll give it a good thrash. So thanks very much for listening to, to this. 
Uh, next week, we'll look at the opening chapter of Hebrew and explore the world of angels. And it would be really good if you could have a look at Hebrews 1 in preparation. And just as a thought for the week, if you are writing a letter to the church in Newark or Southall or wherever it is that you might live, what would you be saying today? What messages of hope and support would you be giving to people today? So that's it, folks. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Uh, take care this week and stay well, and I'll see you uh, very soon.